Gould, uh, who's been a member of our, our trustees for a number of years. Uh, Kingdon has helped the board enormously, uh, not only on the level of fundraising, for example, which where when he says he'll do something, he does it, which is, uh, is wonderful, but also with respect to our, our speakers program. And Kingdon, uh, with regularity, has recommendations. And the program tonight is to uh, uh, almost totally uh, to the good, uh, good graces of Ambassador Kingdon Gould, uh, who, as you know, was uh, our ambassador in the Netherlands for a number of years. So let me introduce Ambassador Kingdon Gould. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We have a particularly interesting speaker for you this evening, as I'm sure you will agree. He is a man who speaks Vietnamese, Spanish, French, and excellent English. <laughs> He's a graduate of the University of Maryland. He went to Harvard, and before he was while teaching at Harvard doing graduate work, before he could complete his uh, degree there, he was called to Vietnam, uh, and he spent five years in Vietnam. They later became a member of Dr. Kissinger's secretariat. Just before the fall of Vietnam, he was tremendously concerned that a number of Vietnamese people, individuals who were working for the United States government would be left there. He asked our government and our embassy to use their very best efforts to get these people out of Vietnam, and this kind of fell on deaf ears. So on his own, he organized a rescue mission, which cost a number of thousands of dollars, which he funded himself, almost $50,000, to rescue these people. I think this is the most extraordinary uh, activity, and it shows you that while we think of the State Department and diplomacy in kind of the abstract, and hands-off, you will find that there are people who are definitely hands-on and do remarkable work in advancing not only uh, decency, uh, correct uh, performance by the United States with regard to people that help the United States. <clears throat> and it's a remarkable thing which he has achieved. And I don't know if he's going to touch on it, his remarks up front, but I would very much ask you in the question and answer session which will follow to be so kind as to ask him a question about it because it's a remarkable story. Now, he's not just a Vietnamese expert because he was subsequently appointed by President Reagan as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Latin America. So there he becomes a Latin American specialist. Then uh, he took another jump, went over to Algeria as our ambassador to Algeria for three years. Having uh, succeeded so well in the Foreign Service, he moved into an international position in business as a senior vice president for the Cabot Corporation of Baltimore in charge of international affairs and subsequently moved to Brussels where he ran the Cabot Plastic Company for a number of years. He was then uh, spotted by President Clinton and appointed to be the director of the Resources Planning and Policy Department for the Secretary of State under Madeleine Albright. And then in, that was from 94 to 99, and then in 1999, last February, he joined the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He returned to uh, private uh, business, or maybe actually public business, you might say, because he's the uh, senior vice president in charge of international, economic, and national security matters. Now, one wonderful thing about Ambassador Johnson is he always has three things to his title. He's not just a uh, senior vice president. It's for international economic and national security items. Before that, 
He was in resources planning and policy, so you can see he is truly an important man. <laughs> As one who has always believed that not only all the good things of uh, the world economically are derived from the activities of business and the uh, and professions, uh, the prof professional people of our country, that uh, uh, these underlie our social security system, these underlie our museums, they underlie our uh, symphony orchestras. I've always had a very warm spot for American industry, and when I had the opportunity to represent our country overseas, uh, I had an opportunity to help American industry over there because it is American industry that makes us strong internationally and from which all the benefits that we have in the complex society in which we live, our trips to the moon, our social security, our uh, preschool programs, they're all derived from the activities of professional people and American business. So <clears throat> the U.S. Chamber of Commerce was a somewhat moribund organization for a number of years. It just acquired, a well, two years ago, a very strong president, and it has made a wonderful choice in having brought Ambassador Craig L. Johnson in, L. Craig Johnson in as the senior vice president for international activities. Without more blabber, I will introduce a very fascinating man who you'll very much enjoy. Ambassador L. Craig Johnston. Thank you, Greg. Well, Ambassador Gould, let me say that uh, your reputation in the chamber uh, is certainly well understood and respected uh, as well. And I thank you for your very kind uh, remarks. You uh, mentioned the fact that I had moved from uh, being Deputy Assistant Secretary for Latin American Affairs to being Ambassador to Algeria. Actually, I was appointed to the position of Deputy Assistant Secretary for Latin America from the political military counselor position in Paris. And when I had that appointment, uh, there, Evans and Novak wrote an article uh, to the effect that wasn't it a scandal that this European specialist was being put into Latin American affairs. Uh, to run Latin American affairs, never mind that my background had really been in Latin American affairs. Um, but when I was put into uh, Algeria in North Africa, uh, the same columnist wrote that it was a scandal uh, <laughs> that this Latin American specialist was being put into the Near East. So in fact, the nature of the Foreign Service is such that you are what you did last. Um, and uh, you develop your expertise as you go along. And in point of fact, my own expertise, uh, to the extent that I had any at all, uh, in the State Department was in crisis management. And I found myself moving throughout my entire career from one crisis to another. Um, and indeed, there are some commonalities in managing crises, and in, I think that there's, a, there's a, a certain amount of credibility to doing that. The, uh, you mentioned the, uh, my experiences uh, in Vietnam, uh, which uh, were, I think, uh, among the most interesting experiences of, of my career. But it's actually been a career that has been full of interesting experiences, and I think most Foreign Service careers actually are. And it's my honor to teach both the ambassadorial seminar uh, for ambassadors going overseas, as well as for the new officers coming into the State Department. And I always tell them at both ends how lucky they are to be in one of the most interesting and exciting careers that there are, and even more so today than has been true in the past. Now, we are, I believe, at a historic moment in this country in terms of the activities that are taking place today. Next week, we will be voting on normal trade relations with China. Now, I know there is a lot of opinion on both sides of the issue of permanent normal trade relations with China, because there's a lot of concern on the part of many people about hum uh, the human rights situation in China, and I think that concern is legitimate. And there's a lot of concern about labor standards and environmental issues in China, and I think those concerns are legitimate as well. And then there's concern on the other side of the issue that isolating China does not seem to be the appropriate way to address the other concerns. 
and that denying American businesses and American workers access to the Chinese market does not seem like the appropriate mechanism for dealing with human rights issues in China. This is a historic vote that I think, however, transcends a lot of these issues. I think this is beginning to take on a lot of the characteristics of the vote on joining the League of Nations after World War I. You know, it's an interesting thing about our history in terms of whether we become involved internationally or whether we become xenophobic and turn inward in an isolationist uh, period of our history. In World War I, we were ripped out of isolationism to fight in that war over enormous reluctance within the country. And when the war was over and our, we sent our soldiers off and they fought bravely and they won the war, when they came back home, we had this enormous internal debate. If you go back and read through the debates, the debates were not about isolationism versus engagement in the world. They were very specific. Debate about the adequacy of the League of Nations. Was it a desirable thing to get involved? Would it entangle us in alliances and in ways that we did not want to be entangled and had not been there to, uh, entangled previously? It, it, it focused on the minutia, but when you look back at it historically now, you'll see that the, the, the basic decisions that were reached at the end of World War I put us into, back into a period of isolationism in our country. World War II came, and we were once again torn out of isolationism. It took a bombing in Pearl Harbor to do it. We did not get involved in the war except in terms of supporting one side financially and with product until we were bombed. So it really took a lot to get us out of a period of isolationism in World War II. But then we engaged, and once again we sent our forces overseas, both in the Pacific and in Europe. We won the war. But after the war, we had quite a different mentality because I think we had learned the lessons of World War I. There are a lot of historians who believe that our isolationism at the end of World War I was one of the precipitating causes of World War II. Had we stayed more fully engaged, we might have been able to prevent the outbreak of the Second World War. Be that as it may, at the end of World War II, we had learned the lessons of World War I and we stayed engaged in the world. We had the Marshall Plan, we had a major effort to reconstruct Japan, and we turned what had been our adversaries in World War II into our allies. And where would we have been in the Cold War if we had not had Japan and Germany on our side? I would tell you the outcome would have been dramatically different. It was a brilliant stroke. We learned the lessons of World War I. In World War I, we won the war, but we lost the winning. In World War II, we won the war and we won the winning. Now we have been through the Cold War. And it, too, was a real war. The question before the American people now, and it's been a question that we've been debating now for almost seven, eight years, is are we going to move toward isolationism, become more xenophobic, or are we going to stay engaged and try and put our imprint on the world? And this China vote that's coming up next week, regardless of the merits of the case individually on each of these individual issues, is turning into a vote on isolationism versus engagement. And if we vote for isolation, we will not get fast track. We will not become participants in the future in a whole range of trade activities. And we will be driven into a xenophobic policy in this country. And if we do end up engaging with China, we have our work cut out to, for us in terms of improving the human rights situation um, and staying engaged with the Chinese and working on their environmental issues and improving labor standards there, to be sure. But we will be engaged and we will be playing in that game. And I would predict to you that other trade agreements will follow it and that we will stay engaged in the world and that this country will prosper as a result of having done that and that the world will be a better place for it. So I don't want to overstate it, but I do think that this coming vote in the, in the Congress on normal trade relations is a critical, critical vote. Now, a lot is changing. This is not the, the, the world of World War I, World War II, or even the Cold War. The changes that we're experiencing in the world today are profound and they're accelerating. I 
am asked often to speak to boards of directors on the issue of change and the accelerating pace of change. It's a fascinating issue. You know, it took 37 years for radio to creep into our country to the same extent that the internet has already crept in in the last four years. When I took over my job as Assistant Secretary for Resources, Plans, and Policy, and I agree with you, that's an awfully long and very pretentious title. In fact, let me take a little aside to tell you that when Warren Christopher introduced me to the press as the new Director for Resources, Plans, and Policy in the Department of State, George Geta of AP stood up and asked the first question as the dean, and he said, if he does resources, plans, and policy, what do you do? <laughs> So you get a sense of how pretentious the title is, and I agree. All, all three subject titles are pretentious. But if, you, if, if you're going to look at the level of change that's taking place in society today, then just stop and consider the impact of the Internet. When, I, when, when Warren Christopher said that, the Internet was not on anybody's horizon. That was 1994. It's just practically yesterday. And today it dominates business. It is amazing the extent that it has penetrated our society and penetrated other societies and increased the interrelationship of people throughout the country. You know that every single day there are more email messages sent over the internet than there are the sum total of all letters written in the history of humanity. Now, is that connectivity or what? I mean, people are connecting much, much more. Not that they're understanding each other any better. Let me tell you. And somewhere it's got to stop. And I know there's probably many of you in this audience like, like me who get in the, to work in the morning and have 300 email messages. No way in hell that you're going to be able to get through them all during the course of the day. So somehow we have to learn to control this monster that we've created out there. But it is a sign of the times of the change that's taking place. At the Department of State, when I was there, we began working on the issue of the changes that were taking place in American foreign policy. First of all, the Department of State, you have to understand, is a policy organization. Indeed, foreign policy was a policy issue. And that makes perfectly good sense, and indeed, a lot of the people, I think, think that it's still that way, but it has changed in pretty fundamental ways. Understand how it used to be during the Cold War. You decided to draw a line between Taiwan and mainland China, and you wanted to tell the Chinese that they, if they crossed that line, there would be certain consequences. This would be analyzed down in the bowels of the organization. A lot of very, very bright, bright people would put together their thinking. They would send up their analyses. There would be a competition of different points of view. The two or three top views would make it up to the Secretary of State. The decision would be made then as to what policy would be pursued, and then it would be announced at the noon press briefing or by the Secretary or put into a speech someplace. And the implementation of policy was the announcement of the policy. The thought process went into the formulation of the policy. Now, I'd contrast that with the situation that we face in the world today, where it is much less the analysis of the policy that counts as the implementation. Today's foreign policy issues are the issues that are the salient issues to the American people. International crime cartels, international narcotics trafficking, runaway population growth, around the world, underdevelopment, helping American business achieve its objectives in the world, promoting exports. What's different about these things? These things are different in the sense that they all require a massive amount of infusion of effort at the bottom of the organization to achieve implementation. You cannot pronounce a policy of saying, we will not have narcotics entering this country anymore. The narcotics keep right on coming in. It doesn't make any difference what it is that you have pronounced in the way of policy. If you don't have a strong implementation arm, if you don't pe put people on the ground to develop alternative crop programs, to, to do interdiction programs, to work on demand uh, within your society as a whole, to work on the whole panoply of things that are required. It requires law enforcement people working in the field with other countries to stop international terrorism. It requires international cooperation to be able to achieve uh, progress in protecting the environment. All of these things are operational, programmatic, and they're quite different in their context. And for an organization like the Department of State, 
to have that fundamental transformation of foreign policy take place in just a few years is a very, very difficult thing to, to, to manage. It's not even the same kind of people, necessarily, that you need to have. It's a different set of skill groups. It's not any different for business. Business has a lot of the very same characteristics to it. Today, it's a global market. If you do not understand that it's a global market, then either you're in a niche within a very small sector, or you will be out of business very soon. Because somebody somewhere will be competing with you, and you have no idea necessarily where they even came from. You may not have even known that the country existed until suddenly they're taking your market share away. And so it is a massive international global competition. That has led to enormous amount of turmoil. It used to be that you signed on for a career. Today, you sign on for a career, and the odds are you're going to change your job six times. You're going to change your employer six times before you finally retire. And maybe it'll be 12 times within the next 10 years, because the nature of business is changing so fast. The nature of the markets are changing. We're losing jobs at a record rate in this country. The good part about it is that we're gaining them at a record rate, and we're gaining them at a much higher rate than we're losing them. But it still causes turmoil. And not everybody who loses their job is the guy who gets the job. Many of them are. We have record low unemployment. But still, it is very unsettling for people. So there's a resistance that's growing up within the society as a whole to all of the change that's taking place. And you see that resistance manifested in a number of different ways. It's a sort of a phenomenon of both the right and the left in the country, of stop the world, let America get off, because it is nerve-wracking. I talk to my friends, uh, most of them who've made a heck of a lot more money than me, out in Washington State in the internet business. And I was talking to one very good friend who just sold his company to Microsoft for $1.7 billion. And he was lamenting the difficulty of training the younger generation. He's 35. <laughs> <laughs> training the younger generation to be able to cope with the rapidity of change that's required in, in today's world. It is amazing. People go to bed at night. They get woken up at midnight with a saying the competitors put a new product online. It's going to come out. You know, it's, it's out on the internet. We need to be able to match the price. We need to be able to change the configuration on the product. And you change the direction that your business goes before you wake up the next morning. I mean, it is absolutely amazing how fast things move in today's world. And this is very, very unsettling for society as a whole. And we need to learn how to cope with that kind of, with that kind of situation. Now, we at the Chamber of Commerce face exactly the same set of issues. We have a lot of the old issues. We still work an awful lot on regulatory issues, which come at us at ever fast pace. I mean, we have spent hundreds and hundreds of man, man hours, man years, working on things like internet taxation, for example, you know, when we didn't even know what the internet was a few years ago. So we're working on a lot of, uh, of issues, but still in the same basic framework of the basic regulatory issues that, that, uh, that business face in the world. But we're also facing a number of other issues. I'll give you some cases in point. Right now, we're working the China issue up on the Congress. That's a fairly traditional issue for us. Um, but we're also working on Cuba. Tom Donahue, who I agree with you, has brought an enormous amount of energy to the Chamber uh, of Commerce. And I went down to, to Cuba uh, this past year. We're working very hard on the sanctions policy. I have a particularly strong point of view on the sanctions. My view is, is that our economic sanctions on Cuba are what sustains Fidel Castro in power. I believe that very firmly. I am not a pro-communist. I have had the job of overthrowing communist governments. So I have a good position from which to argue that we should be removing the economic sanctions on Cuba in order to open the place up. And we're working very hard to get that done. Now, I'll give you a case in point on this. When we were in Cuba, it's a totalitarian regime, I, I tell you. And, and when I, I raised with Alarcón, the president of the National Assembly there, the possibility that we would like to open up an internet cafe in downtown Havana. Well, you can imagine what the reaction was. I practically got thrown out. The idea of a free flow of information is not an acceptable idea to the old liners there. 
But then I was up in New York and met with the foreign minister, a new, young, brash, very, very doctrinaire communist, but new, young, brash, very doctrinaire communist. Um, and we had dinner, and he was saying, why is it that your country can normalize with Vietnam after having lost 50,000 people, but you can't normalize with us? And I said, well, interesting you should ask that, because I was a Vietnam negotiator in Paris for some time. And I can tell you some of the things that Vietnam has done that you haven't done. And one of them is, is that they opened up internet bistros pretty much throughout the country. <laughs> and he said, we wouldn't have any problem doing that. I said, well, that's interesting, because when I was down in Cuba, and I raised the question, they was categorically rejected. He said, I'll fix that. I said, okay, fix it. We met again at the ill-fated WTO meetings in Seattle. And he said, okay, I raised it with Fidel, and Fidel says you can put 150 sites with 20 stations per site into Cuba. Now, let me tell you, if we, if we can do that, and I am busy enlisting the support of American business to get the job done, if we can do that, we will bring about profound change in Cuba. Now, I raised the case with you not to brag about what we're doing in Cuba. I'll be back there before the end of the month again to pursue some of these things. But to point out to you that there's a range of activities here that are not the traditional activities of business organizations, that are the traditional activities of government. Because part of the paradigm shift that we've experienced has been that more and more it's non-governmental organizations that take on some of the salient issues of our time. That's true of humanitarian organizations, after all, the, the, the largest demining convention that we have in the world right now is one that was negotiated by non-governmental organizations and foisted on governments. And we have a lot of that taking place right now. I'll give you another example. We're working very hard right now with the Russian government to try and address the issue of Russia's cooperation on nuclear proliferation in, in Iran. You'll say, this is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. What in God's name are you doing that for? And the reason is very simple. Government has essentially struck out trying to deal with the issue. The U.S. government goes in and talks to the Russians and says, this is unethical, immoral, and they come across to the Russians as being very pedantic. And the Russians have a great deal of pride, and they don't like to be treated in a pedantic way. And so they stick to their guns on this issue. We come in and say, you've got a $15 million deal going with Iran, and I've got a $25 billion deal that is blocking. So, we don't necessarily care what you're doing with Iran. We do care, but, you know. Um, but we would like very much to be able to pursue a $25 billion deal in preference to a $15 million deal. Let's figure out how we can divide this up in a sensible way. And that's a much easier approach to approach the Russians on than is the way that the government is doing it. Now, are we doing it out of context to the government? No, of course, we cooperate very closely with our government on these issues. But it goes on and on and on. When we're dealing with tax policy in the Philippines, it is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce that rolls back the excise taxes that is killing American business there. When we have problems with regulations in Indonesia, it is we who are the ones who get for the IMF its funding from the U.S. Congress each year, the cooperation from the IMF to deal with those problems. Increasingly, in this world, it is not government that solves problems. Government is still absolutely indispensable, don't get me wrong but it is the, the organizations that represent the people in a non-governmental way. Why would that be? What is it that's changed? And what has changed is the fact that geographic boundaries don't count the way they used to. It is a global market, and it is only global organizations that can deal effectively in global markets. And countries are still geographically based, and they will remain very, very important, critical, in fact, but quite frankly, there are a lot of issues that organizations that are not countries need to begin to take on much more seriously. And we're taking on a lot of those. Transparency in government and corruption. We run substantial programs out of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, out of SIPE, the Center for International Private Enterprise, which is run by the Chamber of Commerce, on trying to promote transparency in governments, trying to fight corruption around the world. We do that because American business needs a level playing field around the world. So across all of these things, we are seeing a phenomenal amount of change, both in terms of how government does its, its things, how people do their things through their respective organizations. And what does it all add up to in the end of the day? It adds up to a simple mechanism whereby the American people have an opportunity 
through their various organizations, through their non-governmental organizations, through organizations such as this, to collaborate and to have an impact on international affairs in ways that perhaps they never had before and that they should not be awestruck by the pace of change, but they should try and harness it to achieve our common objectives. We are riding a crest, an economic boom in this country because we have been doing these things. And if we just stay the course, stick with it, this country stands to benefit more from international engagement than any other country in the world. But I will tell you, it is a chancy thing. We are still trying to fight out the issue that we fought out at the end of World War I, at the end of World War II. Is this country going to turn to xenophobia, to isolationism, or is it going to be, be to remain actively engaged in the world, trying to solve the world's problems? And I would urge you to play your role in trying to make sure that we stay engaged. Thank you very much. We uh, thank you for an extraordinarily interesting uh, presentation. Uh, Ambassador Johnson's going, Johnston's going to answer questions, uh, and he's promised that he would repeat your questions for your benefit <laughs> and the benefit of the audience. And uh, if he doesn't, you can feel free to remind him. <laughs> Ambassador Johnston. The question is, um, is uh, the assertion is, is that the regulatory framework uh, that, that, that cities and governments uh, put into effect essentially blocks small entrepreneurial business from being able to start up, that it gives a strong preference to large businesses. And the question is, is there anything that the chamber can do to help to alleviate the problem? Fighting, the, now this is the answer. The, uh, <laughs> fighting, fighting government regulation is one of the things that we do, uh, to be sure. Um, and I'll give you an absolutely crystal clear case of it. You'll recall maybe three months ago now, OSHA put out a regulation which would have regulated the use of any kind of business out of the home. So that you would have had to in your home have ergonomic standards, you would have had to have a, an inspector out, and you can imagine that the net impact of that, had it stayed in effect, uh, would have been just to stop making it possible for people to run businesses out of their homes. Um, the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce mounted a massive and immediate campaign in opposition to that. We phoned everybody in Washington. We got businesses across the country to phone in, and we marshaled hundreds and hundreds of phone calls in 24 hours on that issue. And it created such a firestorm <coughs> in, in Washington that the regulation was rolled back almost instantly. Uh, these things are very common. Uh, you will have well-meaning, well-intended people in the bureaucracies of both state and, and local and federal governments who want to achieve very positive objectives, put out rules that they think are well-founded rules, but that are fraught with unintended consequences and that cost tons of money and that essentially make it impossible for people to, to operate at anything except the macro level. And I agree with you totally. I think there's an awful lot that can be done to roll back the regulatory frameworks for very, very small businesses. Now, but you have to be very careful how you do that. We do not want small businesses discriminating on the basis of, of sex or race. We don't want unethical practices. So how do you draw the line in this thing in a way that preserves the standards that we have as a country and the values that we have while stripping away unnecessarily bureaucratic regulations. And we spend a lot of our time cruising back and forth across that line trying to figure out where the appropriate place is. But if you have specific cases that you want to bring to my attention, I'll be glad to look into each and every one of them because this is an area of considerable interest to the chamber. The question uh, it relates to the allegations around the world of the U.S. being uh, a, a hegemonic power and uh, and uh, the criticisms that we receive for being too powerful uh, and juxtaposed against my request that people stay engaged and that the country stay engaged there. I think there is a difference between being engaged and being arrogant. And I think we sometimes tend to be arrogant in how we conduct ourselves around the world. Um, I think we need to bend over backwards as the world's only superpower to try not to be arrogant. I don't think we will ever satisfy everybody. I think we will forever be criticized 
as long as we are the most powerful, because I think the most powerful always are criticized. But I think we have to bend over backwards to try and, and explain our actions. Well, let me give you a case in point. When I was at, st at the State Department, I'm telling tales out of school, nobody from the State Department here, right? When I, when I was at State, there was a, a, a broad sentiment that we didn't need to have a public diplomacy effort around the world anymore. Because after all, USIA had been invented as a counter-propaganda mechanism to Soviet propaganda. And it fought a propaganda war in the, in, in the Cold War. And quite frankly, did a damn good job of it uh, in, in terms of putting out the, you know, in putting down the lies that came out of the Soviet Union and putting out a good image of America. And I think that, that it was true. It was set up that way, and that is the job that it did. But what I think people missed the point on at the time was the fact that in this world, a world of increasing transparency, governments are very limited in their latitude of action. They're limited because the people know what the policies are. They understand the news from all around the world. And in point of fact, when you're dealing with governments today, they almost always say, I can't do that because my hands are tied by my own public opinion. And everywhere you go, I, I, I had a long conversation with uh, Pascal Lamy, the head of the trade office for the, e, for the European Commission. Um, and the discussion related to sales in Europe of uh, biologically modified agriculture products. And he said, okay, on some of these things I agree totally with you. I mean, there's absolutely no threat from these things. Uh, and the concern, uh, the public concern comes from mad cow disease, which doesn't relate to these things uh, in, any, in any direct way. Um, but my hands are tied by public opinion. Now, what do you do in the face of that if you do not have the mechanisms uh, internationally for influencing public opinion? And I think there it is even more important today that our government have a strong public diplomacy arm around the world than it was during the Cold War, because public opinion counts much more today than it did during the Cold War. And I think you can mobilize that public diplomacy to at least explain what it is that we're doing and why it is that we're doing it. Now, we're never going to overcome all of the criticisms, to be sure, but I think we can help to ameliorate them. Do we, do we have to be the world's policemen? Do we have to send troops to every single flare-up that happens around the world? Uh, we send troops uh, currently to less than half of the flare-ups that the UN is involved in, so it's not entirely as bad as that, but we do send troops in an awful lot of places around the world. I don't think that we necessarily have to send troops to all of the flare-ups around the world. I think, quite frankly, there are some flare-ups that just have to be left to burn out. Um, I, I, it's very painful, let me tell you, when you're looking at a situation uh, to say that, but I think that's just a fact of life. We do not have the capacity to manage and to regulate the world and to be the world's policeman. I do think that we can play a much more significant role, however, in organizing the structures that can deal with these problems around the world. But as long as we have a Congress of the United States that, doesn't, that refuses to pay our dues to the international organizations, you're not going to end up having the influence in those organizations that you need to have to be able to organize the kinds of efforts that I think would make it possible for us to not have to send our troops into these, these situations. The question is about sanctions, and can I comment about, uh, there, there's a lot of debate about the pros and cons of sanctions, and just to comment on it from, from our perspective. First of all, I'm not opposed to sanctions. I think sanctions can be a very effective tool for achieving your objectives. I think unilateral sanctions, sanctions cannot. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to me how I can't see the mechanism whereby the United States imposing a sanction that nobody else respects in the world is going to have a meaningful impact on any country around the world. It isolates us rather than the other country. All the rest of the world, including the guy we're trying to sanction, are cooperating and we are left out. So it's the unilateral sanction side that I have serious problems with. Even then, there may be times when you would find it impossible to be dealing with a country. I think we could not have had a normal trade relationship with Cuba in the months immediately following the Cuban Missile Crisis, even though the rest of the world did. I think there are times like that. Uh, but quite frankly, as a consistent policy of having a unilateral sanction, I think it's, it's, uh, it's preposterous. It only damages us uh, in the long run. And I think, quite frankly, it, it, uh, it is used by the sanctioned country as ammunition to continue doing what it is that they're doing. And I think that's certainly true in the case of, in the case of Cuba. The question relates to genetically engineered crops and what's being done about, about it since it's become a very uh, uh, sort of contentious issue within this country um, and that 
it has profound consequences for a country like India. Uh, there are lots of people doing lots of different things on this issue, on all sides of the issue. Uh, from our perspective at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, we would argue that sound science is the critical factor, uh, recognizing right off the bat that that's a very difficult criterion to apply, but that if there is an opportunity to be able to do genetic engineering on crops that would make it possible to feed a lot more people in the world uh, and to alleviate a lot of the human suffering in the world, that we should not close the doors on those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Uh, that we should explore them, which we should be very, very careful what we do in these areas for fear of manipulating things in ways that would get away from us, but that we should not close the door on the opportunities for substantially enhanced agricultural production through genetic engineering. We have been doing genetic engineering in a natural way for a long time, since the beginning of, of, of mankind, in point of fact. I mean, uh, things like cows, as we recognize them today, don't, didn't exist in nature. Um, they have come to exist the way they are through very careful breeding programs. Today's mechanisms allow for an acceleration of that process. Um, and not to say that there are not dangers and risks associated with it, but if they're controlled, they can be mobilized, I think, to, to help alleviate an awful lot of human suffering. The question is, is uh, what is our position on, U on, on sanctions toward Iraq? And assuming that we are for removing those sanctions, what was the last part? Would it be economic or military or both? Uh, first of all, the sanctions against Iraq are not unilateral sanctions. They're multilateral sanctions. They're, they're blessed by the United Nations, controlled by a UN process. Um, and uh, we are not in favor of automatically removing them. That is to say, that depends very much on the conduct of Iraq. We have a bias, I will tell you quite frankly, against sanctions that have a humanitarian component such as sanc uh, sanctions of food and sanctions of medicines. And so therefore, we tend to oppose those sanctions even if they're multilateral. Um, but on other sanctions on Iraq, we have not taken a position of saying that these sanctions are bad. <laughs> Quite frankly, the conduct of Iraq continues to be of great concern to not just us, uh, but I think to most of the countries in the world. As long as they're maintained in a multilateral way, then we would not oppose those sanctions. Uh, now, Iran is a different case. Iran is going through extraordinary internal struggle and change right now. It's not clear what the outcome is going to be. Uh, but there are a lot of the sanctions that we have, in effect, are, in effect, unilateral sanctions. And we would favor removing those sanctions. The question is, are, are US-based multinational uh, companies uh, more than ever uh, met, uh, influencing, I would, I would say, US foreign policy? Um, and how do you draw the lines, then, uh, for what is appropriate, what is inappropriate in that area? The, I think the answer is, is probably yes. That is, at a time when, when imports and exports uh, added together constituted 10 percent of our GNP, uh, obviously, international trade and the activities of the companies engaged in international trade didn't count as much as they do when it now crosses 30 percent of GNP. Um, so it's almost inevitable. If you're that big a part of the driving force of the economy, if trade plays that big a role, uh, if, if international financial movements play that big a role in the economy, then you're going to go to the people who uh, are playing those roles to see what it is that, that influences uh, success or failure. And that does give, I think, an increased voice to, to, uh, to business and to financial institutions. I, I was talking to, to uh, Jamie Gorelick, uh, who's the, uh, the deputy head of Fannie Mae, speaking at a conference of our Center for Corporate Citizenship last Monday. Um, and she pointed out a very interesting fact, and that is that currently in the U.S. domestic mortgage market, 40 percent of all of the funds come from overseas. Can you imagine the consequences? to the mortgage market if you were to take 40 percent of the total funds out of that market? Pretty profound. Now, people talk all the time about the benefits of exports. And clearly, there are benefits of exports. It creates jobs here domestically. It's a wonderful thing. Imports have at least as great a benefit to them. They maintain price structures. It's what keeps our inflation down in this country. It makes it possible for people to have a higher standard of living. They're very important imports. But it also provides the wealth overseas that allows the exports. And it provides the wealth overseas that funds that 40% of money that comes back into our home mortgage market as well. 
International trade has a lot of spin-off effects, and so when you go fiddling it with it, you need to be very careful what you're doing. The question here is, is did we ever raise with the Russians uh, in our discussions with them the issue of graft within Russia and the enormous disincentive it is to investment? And I can tell you I have met with probably 50 Russian officials, and I have never failed to mention that whole issue and to discuss it with them. We run programs in Russia on this issue through SIP. Um, and it is, it is the principal reason why Russia is not succeeding economically today. Um, I think there is a fair amount of, uh, of will to address the problem, but not necessarily the skill and the means to be able to do it. It is so large that it's very difficult for people to get their arms around it. You know, if you don't raise this issue in the first five minutes with the Russian minister, you raise it with you. Um, because I think they do recognize the problem. I met with Primakov, for example. Um, and, uh, and we were, we were talking, and you know, I was trying to be polite, and he was talking about the corruption problem. I said, well, we've had to wrestle with corruption problems of our own in the United States in the past, and, you know, we've, we've developed some expertise at being able to do it. Immediately stopped me and says, you have no idea. <laughs> you know, now, I don't know if he knows about Chicago and some of the woolly days, but I think he's right. There's no comparison. In, in Russia today, it is... Uh, terrible situation in which the, the system is working by, uh, through, the, through the mechanisms of corruption more than through the mechanisms of official transfers. But you know, it's not surprising. I would predict that the first problem that Cuba is going to have to face when they move into a capitalist system is exactly the same problem. Here you, do, you train the people in the society to beat the system. Everybody in the society is a skilled beater of the system because the system doesn't work. A socialist economic system, regrettably, this is a sort of a utopian, so it is regrettably, is simply not functional. It doesn't work. So what happens immediately springs up an alternative system. It's illegal, and a modus vivendi is reached with the, with the authoritarian leadership because having everything that works be illegal is wonderful if you're in charge of a country because you can arrest anybody you want, any time you want, because they're all, if they even exist, they're engaged in the illegal activity. So after you train these group of people on how to beat systems, then you come in and say, okay, we've got a new system. You think they're going to stop trying to beat the system? Of course not. They keep right on trying to beat the system. And we have had to face that problem everywhere that we have had a socialist structure previously. And you have to work your way through that. And I think working our way through it in Russia is a formidable task. I think there's an awful lot of people trying to get the job done, but so far they haven't made much of a net in the problem. The question w related back to the question that had previously been said, uh, and that is, uh, could we describe the situation in Vietnam at the end of the Vietnam War uh, there? Um, when I left uh, Henry Kissinger's staff uh, to go back to Vietnam in the face of the situation there with a colleague from the Deputy Secretary's staff, um, uh, we uh, arrived back in Vietnam and found the most unbelievable situation. I visited the aid mission headquarters and they were working on the strategic plan for how to handle rural agricultural products in the next year. I mean to say this is, this is seven or eight days before the fall of Saigon and there was a sense of unreality in Saigon still amongst an awful lot of people who simply could not believe that the whole thing was going to fall apart. It was really quite remarkable, and I think contributed to this, this sort of benign uh, neglect on the part of our embassy at the time in terms of getting organized the people who had to get out of, out of Vietnam, and led to some of the chaos at the very end uh, of our time in Vietnam. It ended up being uh, a very exciting time with smuggling people into airports and hiding them in, in the trunks of cars and paying off people and forging documents. Some of us forged documents, I won't say which, uh, in order to be able to get people through the various mechanisms uh, in Vietnam. And then, of course, as you got closer and closer to the fall, the reality began sinking in people. The panic set in. And we would have whole families. I'll give you one anecdote that's a painful anecdote uh, from the situation. On our way to Vietnam, we took the last Pan American flight into Vietnam. This was the last commercial flight in, and it was lucky to even get that. And we stopped in Hawaii and caught it out of Hawaii to, to Saigon. And in Hawaii, while we were at the airport, a fellow who had worked for me in Vietnam and who stayed there after I had been there came out to the airport and said that he, he wanted to get on the flight. They wouldn't let him on the flight. At that time, they closed it down. And uh, he asked me to help him get out his new bride, very young girl, maybe 18, 17 or 18, who he had married 
just before he left Vietnam. And I undertook to see what I could do in that regard. So when I got to Vietnam, and I was in the middle of lots of people of similar kinds of, of, of stories, so it was very, uh, it was a sort of a sleepless 24-hour day thing there. We began moving into the edge of, uh, uh, of hallucinating. Uh, I nonetheless met, I, I, I got in contact with this young lady, and she came and met me at the Continental Hotel in Saigon, which is a fine old French establishment, very Graham Greenish uh, in its, uh, its ambiance. And, uh, and I sat there with her mother and this, and this girl, and she wanted to leave, but her mother did not want her to leave. And she would not leave unless her mother gave her permission to leave. So we talked, and we talked, and we talked, and I had to, I had to get out. So I left her with the message that I would meet her one more time. I met her a second time, then went again with her mother. Mother was still adamant about it, couldn't convince her. So I told her that I would meet her in front of the cathedral the day that we were supposed to leave and get out, just at the very end, um, at 10 o'clock in the morning, if she convinced her mother or if she decided to just go anyway. So I went to the cathedral at 10 o'clock in the morning, and I waited there until about 10.20. Not a soul showed up. And I left. We got a letter from her about, actually I think it was about eight months later, that somebody smuggled out, saying that she had decided at the last moment that she would go. She gathered up her things and she went to say goodbye to a friend, and the friend had wanted to come with her. And the friend had taken so long packing up her things that she wanted to take that they didn't get there until 10.30. And you know, I don't think they ever got out. And that's, that's the nature of Vietnam. I'm aware of the meetings between Robert McNamara and the decision makers of that time, um, and I'm wondering if any good has come out of, out of those meetings. Uh, and the, the honest answer is, is I am aware of the fact that the meetings have taken place, but I, had, I don't know enough about them to make an informed judgment on it. I, I really just don't, I don't know. I will tell you something that I, I didn't talk about Vietnam for an awful long time after, after the war, or particularly after 1975, and the first time that I ever spoke about Vietnam to a public forum was to the Veterans of Foreign Wars in, in Utah. Uh, they had a big VFW convention. I don't know if any of you are VFW members, but when they have a convention, man, they have a convention. It's a big thing. And they filled up this, uh, this, this uh, Salt Lake City's uh, auditorium. And I mean, I'm talking about tens of thousands of people. It's amazing how many people they turn out. And they had invited, this was back during the election campaign, Clinton's re-election, um, and during that race. And they had invited Perot and Dole and Clinton to speak. And at the time, I was in the State Department. And uh, you know, Dole and Perot agreed to speak, but Clinton had lost Utah in his first election bid um, and didn't want to go back to Utah. So they, they, they finessed and they sent down through the bowels saying, would somebody fill in for the president? And of course, you know, I was the guy out of town. And so uh, you know, I get back into town saying, you're going to fill in for the president in Utah. So uh, talk about terrible situations to, to be in because they weren't terribly fond of him anyway. Um, and, and he had snubbed them for this thing. So I decided, well, you know, the only way I'm going to talk to this audience is to talk about the things that we have in common, and that was Vietnam. So I, t I talked to them about Vietnam, and I told them what I really believe about Vietnam, and that is that the historians, including McNamara, the historians have looked at Vietnam as a, as, as a war in which we won all of the battles but we lost the war. And the proposition that I put to them, which is a proposition I believe, is that Vietnam was not really a war in the traditional sense of a war. It was a battle in the Cold War. And we lost the battle, but we won the war. So exactly the opposite. So I draw a different conclusion, because I think for the people that are the veterans of foreign wars, to have gone off and lost a war is a humiliating experience. But to have lost a battle in a one war is not. And I think that's the way the country should see Vietnam as well. What is our view on, on how to manage the risks associated with, uh, with investments, particularly, I would imagine, in third world countries? Um, and, and what do we do about it when people do uh, lose? And I guess the, the, the answer to that gets back to the basic issue of risk and risk management. Um, you know, every company in the world undertakes risky propositions. 
if you don't undertake risky propositions, you won't ever make money. It's very much like being in the stock market. The, your returns normally relate some, to some extent on the risks that you take. Um, and if you lose, you lose. It's, it's just that simple. It may be very tragic for the people involved on both sides of the equation, both the local company as well as, as the U.S. partner, but there's no big guarantor out there. Now, there are some insurance schemes that do provide some guarantees, and quite frankly, I was once the beneficiary when I was at Cabot Corporation of, uh, of OPIC, political risk insurance in Iran, um, so that there are mechanisms that companies can turn to, both in the private sector as well as in the public sector, to help to offset some levels of risk. Those mechanisms are not well developed, in my view, in this country, and they're really poorly developed throughout the third world, where the risks obviously are much higher. Uh, but risk is an inerrant part of business. You know, it's a funny thing about that. When I, I used to explain this in government all the time, where you've got to bat a hundred, you know, a thousand constantly. If you're not perfect, then you're no good at all. And that means that people, in their efforts to be perfect, don't undertake risk, and as a result, you miss all of the all of the good opportunities. And I'd explain my time at Cabot Plastics, where if I ever got a marketing person, I'd send them out to a country, and they came back and said I talked to ten potential customers, and they all bought the product. I'd fire the guy on the spot. You don't come back if you're batting that kind of a rate. You just keep right on selling. It isn't until you get up to a 30-40% you know, failure rate that you know that you've succeeded. And that's true for an awful lot of things. Now, it's not true for nuclear nonproliferation, you know. <laughs> but if you're not prepared to take some risks in your, in your undertaking, then, uh, then you're not going to have much in the way of success. Unfortunately, it does wreak havoc on people uh, and on companies when, when things go wrong. But that's, that's the game. It's a, it's a competitive structure. The, uh, the advantage of having three parts of a title is you can answer a question on any topic. <laughs> this has been a spectacular evening, and it's been a very, very enjoyable evening. All your answers, I think, have been uh, solid and interesting. But the range of the questions has been truly entertaining, I believe, as well. I think it's been a very beneficial and educational evening. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. It was a lot of fun. You have a fun group.